Lyme disease. What is it? How do you notice it at different stages? And what are the treatments? Those are the kinds of things we're, we'll be covering in the video today. And I'm going to guide you through a short, comprehensive understanding of this disease and how it's treated. This is a map of the US and all of the different uh, Lyme endemic areas there are. So the darker the area in red, the more Lyme disease has been found in those places. Now, because Lyme is carried by ticks, and ticks, these ticks like to hang out on deer as well as on humans and other things like pets, dogs, they're going to be found in forested areas where the deer population is higher. And that just so happens to be the coastlines. So we have uh, New Jersey as actually our most Lyme endemic state, and then the surrounding areas of Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York uh, are very highly affected by Lyme disease. So if you are suspecting Lyme, these are the areas where it is more common and where the suspicion would be the most warranted of any state. So Lyme is about exposure, more common in those who go outside, go to heavily deer populated areas, or live beside an area that has a forest. So if you're living in the middle of Manhattan, for example, it's a lot more difficult to get Lyme unless you go out for hiking and things like that. Than if you're, for example, in a forested area out by the edge of New Jersey. So diagnosing Lyme is pretty straightforward, but can be sometimes very tricky. It's straightforward if you have a tick bite and a confirmed tick. Let's say the person brings the tick in with them for the clinic. And then they develop a rash, which can look like a bullseye. That's called erythema migrans. Then you can go ahead and just start antibiotics you have a confirmed case of Lyme disease. So tick plus rash, antibiotics. Now, let's say you have a suspicion of tick bite. The person lives in a wooded area, they go hiking a lot, and they develop symptoms of Lyme that are not including the rash. That's when you would want to do additional testing. So either ELISA or Western blot. And the symptoms of Lyme, they're very widespread and not always clear cut. The rash is the most clear cut symptom of Lyme disease. The other things like meningitis, arthralgias, fevers, all of those are very difficult to discern from other diseases. So then you would, if you have a suspicion of tick bite and some other symptoms that are not rash, you can do additional testing. That would be your ELISA plus Western blot. And then you can decide on treatment based on the results from those tests. Now, if you don't have symptoms of disseminated Lyme disease and you don't have a rash, uh, but you have a possible tick bite, then Lyme disease is extremely unlikely. Not all ticks carry Lyme. So I think only about 20% of, of deer ticks would have the possibility of carrying Lyme. And even then, you'd have to have the tick on you for at least 48 to 72 hours for Lyme to be transmitted effectively. So uh, the transmission of Lyme, even though it happens a lot, it's it's not always clear cut, even if you are infected with a Lyme carrying tick. Now let's say you are infected with Lyme and then you get the disease. There are various stages of Lyme disease depending on when the original bite happened. And the, the stages have different symptoms. So if you're in stage one versus stage two versus stage three, the symptoms can look entirely different. That's why we're gonna run through each stage of Lyme and how the timeline looks like. So first, uh, the easiest way to remember the stages of Lyme is to remember weeks, months, and years. So one to two weeks would be stage one, one to two months would be stage two, and one plus years would be stage three. So in a week, week's time zone, in a month's time zone, and in a year's time zone, you'd have different symptoms of Lyme disease. So it's very hard to determine when a person might have been bitten by a tick because the ticks, as I said, are extremely small, especially in the stage when they carry and transmit Lyme. So we can determine some of the uh, estimations of when the person got bit by their symptomatology. Now, one to two weeks post bite, 80% of individuals who are affected will have this red rash, which we call erythema migrans. And I'll show you a picture in just a second. But classically, it looks like a bullseye rash. Sometimes it'll just look like a red expanding rash with no central uh, redness because that central redness kind of goes away first and then the rash just tends to expand in a red sort of patch. So it's not always a bullseye appearance, 
but if you have a bullseye appearance, that's clear cut, very clear cut Lyme, okay? Um, especially if you have a confirmed tick bite. And this will be usually associated with fever, fatigue, malaise, lethargy, headaches, myalgias, and arthralgias. So joint pain, it'll feel like you're cold, have a cold or flu, and you have this associated rash. That's highly suspicious for Lyme. Now here we have some images of our Lyme type rashes. And these are all called erythema migrans, even though not all of them have the central bullseye appearance. Now here, this is a home run Lyme disease rash, very easy to identify looks like a bullseye. But it doesn't always look like this. Sometimes it's a more of a homogeneous red patch, and you can see it on different parts of the body, it, as I've shown here on the leg and here on the armpit. So if this person has other symptoms of Lyme disease on top of this rash, then you definitely want to test them for Lyme disease, especially if they live in an endemic area with these kinds of Borrelia ticks. So we've covered stage one, which is usually rash plus cold and flu-like symptoms. Now stage two, which is one to two months, we have additional symptoms which are more difficult to tease apart, especially in someone who has been bitten by a tick over a month ago, probably forgot about it, discounted the rash as anything. Now we have migratory arthralgias. This is a form of Lyme arthritis, and it usually affects larger joints, knees, uh, hips, elbows, and it doesn't stay in one joint for too long. It'll move from one joint to another. So my knee hurt last week and now my elbow really hurts and my hip also hurts. It won't be, uh, it usually won't stay in one joint. It'll move between joints. So as one joint heals, the other one starts to become affected. And that's what we call migratory. It seems to move throughout the body. And we have neurological symptoms. So facial palsies like Bell's palsy where your cranial nerves on one side are affected and you can have some facial droop, eyelid droop, things like that. Um, radicular pain, which is kind of a, an associated tendon and joint pain, paresthesias and paresis, which is nerve association. So really here we're fo focusing on pain in the joints and moves, nerve type pain, things like meningitis, where it would be affecting the central nervous system. This would be a really terrible headache. Um, pain with moving the neck and head around that would be more suspicious of a meningitis type, type picture uh, Lyme carditis so it can also affect the heart and one of the dangerous things Lyme can do to the heart and that's why you would want to do an EKG on this person it was it would cause a heart block so it would mess with the conducting nerves inside the heart so as you can see the nerves are the second most second affected thing by Lyme so first we have the skin then we have the nerves. And the nerves in the heart, if you have AV block, you can get something called Adam-Stokes syndrome, where the AV block would cause your heart to pause and then you would pass out. That's what Adam-Stokes is. And in the European variants of Lyme, which is interesting, you have additional skin type symptoms where you have um, multiple erythema migrans rashes that appear after the first one. Uh, you can get violaceous nodules and these are like these ones he's seen here on this guy's earlobe where other patches of red skin appear after the original rash and this happens months later and you can have associated lymphadenopathy where lymph nodes start getting big in those areas so these are secondary skin manifestations remember nerves are the second thing to go after skin and that usually happens one to two months after so facial drooping meningitis signs severe headache uh, heart block with associated Adam Stokes where you could pa potentially pass out from such a severe heart block are secondary Lyme symptoms. Now after the second stage, uh, if Lyme isn't caught by then and it's allowed to progress, let's say this person doesn't have access to medical care or nobody's caught the disease or have properly identified it, you would enter into stage three of Lyme, which would be one year plus after being bit, where you can have meningitis but this is aseptic, so they would not find any organisms in this meningitis form. Um, it would be kind of a residual inflammation that would happen for a long time afterwards. And, and you can also get psychotic symptoms, so uh, bipolar, depression, things that would affect mental health. Uh, these are late-term symptoms of Lyme. So now it's really affecting the brain, the spinal cord, the central nervous system, is kind of the final frontier for Lyme. 
you can also get this late stage skin manifestation called acrodermatitis chronica atrophicans and where you have these dark uh, hairless patches of skin which are affected by Lyme disease. So we have late stage skin and late neurological symptoms mainly affecting the central nervous system as our last uh, frontier for Lyme disease. Now finally, just so we can keep this video uh, fairly concise, let's go through some of the treatment options for Lyme. Doxycycline is our home run medication. Uh, it's 100 milligrams twice daily for anywhere from 14 to 21 days. And really the uh, medication used to be contraindicated in kids less than eight because of potential issues with tendons and uh, teeth growth, uh, mineral absorption. But now it's been approved for shorter courses. So if the course is less than 21 days, let's say the child gets a two week course, then it's okay to give. It will not have a detrimental impact. This is for long term courses of doxycycline in children where you can get that mineral uh, bone issues, especially with teeth. Uh, the second treatment here is amoxicillin. So amoxicillin 500 milligrams three times daily. And this is mainly used for women who are pregnant or nursing because of the doxycycline effects in mineral absorption in children and the bone effects. So if you are nursing or pregnant, then amoxicillin is the go-to drug. Do not use doxycycline. Um, for everyone else, doxycycline is great. If you're very young, then amoxicillin will also likely be the preferred choice. Now our third drug here that we're going to discuss is ceftriaxone. This is an IV medication, two grams oral daily, and this can also be given for 14 to 21 days. This is for later stage Lyme, stage two or stage three, where you have symptoms of nerve involvement, meningitis, carditis, neuropathy, and for people who are resistant and re getting recurrent arthritis with confirmed Lyme after a course of doxycycline. So uh, this is the hospital drug usually you have to get admitted to a hospital for this because it's an iv medication and it needs to be given for a pretty extended course the last one is post-exposure prophylaxis so let's say you get bitten by a tick and you you're in a very high endemic area for lyme you can get doxycycline 100 milligrams two times a day that's what bid stands for for 14 days that is the prophylactic dose for uh, if you're highly suspicious that this area is very high in Lyme and you have a confirmed tick bite, then this is the prophylactic dose after exposure. So doxy, amoxy, and ceftrioxy are the drugs of choice. Doxy for everyone, amoxy for pregnant and nursing women and extremely young children, and ceftriaxone for people who have neurological manifestations, stage two, stage three, um, treatments for Lyme. And remember, if you get bitten and you're very sure that it's Lyme, Doxy 100 for two weeks, two times a day will be the post-exposure dosage. All right, I hope this video has been helpful and a good summary of Lyme disease, and I'll see you guys in the next one.